Originally released in 2002, Dot Hack Infection puts you in the role of Kite, or whatever you name him, a first time player of a virtual reality MMORPG called The World. A game where you're playing a game. Going as far as giving you a desktop where you can change your wallpaper, or email back and forth with your buddies. You can even check the news, cat toilets, what a time to be alive. And then when you're ready, log into the world and start the grind. But not everything is as it seems. Rumors of strange occurrences and missing players plague the forum, and before long, we're drawn into a web of both mystery and conspiracy as we piece together the puzzle to the truth behind the very game itself. Your first time logging in, you'll be meeting up with your friend from school, Yasuhiko, or as he's known in the world, Orca. Already being a level 50 character, he'll be teaching us some of the basics. First off, forming a party. In the world, you can have up to two players in your party to adventure with. These players can be different classes, each specializing in a different type of weapon. To add a player to your party, you'll first need their member address, which allows you to call on them anytime from town. Though living up to being a simulated MMO, sometimes players will be offline and just won't respond. Like this orca guy. He ends up ignoring us for most of the game, asshole. But don't worry, we'll still find plenty of other players to help along the way. Then there's the Chaos Gate. This portal is used to teleport to different areas by combining three keywords that each have various attributes, allowing you to determine an area's level or element, along with other modifiers, so you can custom tailor areas to your needs, or just experiment for the fun of it. Other players will also post helpful combinations on the board, unlocking even more keywords for you to play with. But let's get back to Orca, we left our guy waiting. We arrive in a beginner-friendly area where Orca walks us through the core gameplay loop of the world. That is, explore the field, find the dungeon, make your way to the bottom floor, and then find the treasure at the Got statue. Well, along the way, you find plenty of magic portals that contain monsters. However, after entering this dungeon, we're caught off guard, seeing a girl in white being chased by some creature way too scary for a level 1 area. Let's just pretend we didn't see that. After getting our <laughs> rainbow card, the game seems to glitch out. As the girl in white appears again, she offers Orca a book, saying that within lies the power of either destruction or salvation at the whim of the user. But in that moment, the pursuer reappears, and while Orca attempts to fight it, none of his attacks seem to register. He's quickly defeated, lifted up and crucified, before this monster uses a visually distinct ability that causes Orca to just break and disappear. Just as the creature turns to us and begins to use that same ability, someone intervenes and somehow teleports us away, where we then see the book, once offered to Orca, now float down and into us. The next day, I found out that Yasuhiko had been hospitalized. But what the hell happened to him? I have a feeling that the key to it is somewhere in the world. Desperate for answers, we make a post on the board, hoping to find someone who may have information about our friend's mysterious coma. But our post is quickly deleted, leaving us with no choice but to keep playing and search for answers ourselves. Upon logging in, we're confronted by a scantily clad lass who rudely gets in our face and accuses us of being rude, only to then follow up by giving us her member address and some keywords and then asking if we'll accompany her. Damn, boys, I think we're in. But as a power play, I'm gonna make her wait while I show you around town. Around Makanu, you'll find a variety of shops and facilities for players to prepare for their next dungeon. You'll have your weapon and magic shops, an item shop, as well as what's called the Elf's Haven, which functions as storage due to only being able to carry up to 40 types of items at once. 
You can also interact with other players around town, trading gear or just hearing them out on whatever weird shit they have to say. What the fuck? Some will have specific trades they offer in their dialogue, usually for extremely rare items. And in general, trading is just a good way to get decent gear early on. And while we're here, we just have to acknowledge the beauty of this town. Not necessarily the quality of the graphics, but the soul. This serene and soothing ambience. This town is really something special. Using the keywords that we obtained from Black Rose, we arrive in an area unlike any other. Surrounded by a sea of clouds, the only path leads to a large cathedral, and as we approach, the area's theme slowly fades in, as if coming from inside. Within the cathedral, we find a statue of a young girl wrapped in chains, with eight of them in particular holding her in place. By the way, uh... Hmm? I guess you can tell that I'm a newbie too. Black Rose begins to hint at some ulterior motive for coming here, but is quickly interrupted when a player named Balmonk shows up, warning us of danger just moments before a monster appears from above. And while Balmonk is quick to dispatch it, it immediately revives, now glowing with a green hexagonal pattern surrounding it. Balmonk explains a virus is rewriting its data, preventing it from dying. Seeing Black Rose rush into danger triggers our traumatic flashbacks. When suddenly we hear a voice, telling us to open the book. Upon opening the book, it seems to install something in our character, giving us that same strange ability that we saw used to put our friend Orca in a coma. But with that same ability, we were able to extract the virus from this monster, allowing Balmonk to defeat it for good. Though Balmonk becomes suspicious of us, having just witnessed us use seemingly hacked abilities, he blames us for the spread of the virus throughout the world. And while Black Rose manages to broker a temporary truce, <laughs> we're definitely on his shit list. I still do not trust you. I just require the time to think this through. But if I find out that you are indeed in with them, I will kill you. Okay. Upon checking our email, we discover that someone named Helba is aware of our ability, Data Drain. She warns us that excessive use could be lethal, and also that we're being watched. Just who is this mysterious stranger? And how does she know so much about our situation? Ah, I don't care. We're finally done talking about setup. Let's go into gameplay. When you first arrive in an area, you're in what's known as the field. Exploring, you'll find magic portals scattered across the map. Getting too close to those portals will summon monsters. If you're within range of a monster, you can tap the attack button to do small damage or you can hop into your skill menu where you'll find all your big damage attacks at the cost of SP. Switching weapons or armor will change your available attacks and spells. At any point, you can issue commands to your teammates. Whether you need certain types of attacks, need first aid, or even issue strategic commands directing which enemies you want them to focus on. And as long as one party member is still alive, you still have access to the party menu. So it's possible to command first aid from beyond the grave. Using the skills command will have party members use their most powerful attacks, both physical and magical. And by setting them up with gear that gives them the elemental attacks that you lack, you'll really get the most out of your party members. Many monsters will have an element, and by using the opposite element, you can get a critical hit for real big damage and make monster dead real fast. There's fire and water, thunder and darkness, and wood and earth. Opposites. And as long as you're using the opposing element, nothing can stop you. Seriously, if you're ever stuck in this game, just go for an elemental skill, and that's it. You're, you win. You win the game. I'd recommend stopping at the magic shop and buying at least 10 of each element spell, just to be safe. Oh, and speed charms, because... 
continuing to explore the field, you may find a spring of mist, which gives you the option to throw in some gear, only to be greeted by... this guy. What? He'll ask if you dropped a golden or silver axe, but if you answer neither, you may actually get a better item in return. Till next time, goodbye! Alright! This is a great way to upgrade weapons throughout the whole game, so make sure to always have some spare gear. And then, once you're ready, it's time to venture into the dungeon. Dungeons have various designs based on the element of the area, but you can always find it on your minimap. Pressing select will toggle the map's zoom, or disable it if you actually want to see the game. Seriously, why is the HUD so big? Once you're in the dungeon, things are going to get a little bit more difficult. Your goal is to make it to the very bottom, but unlike in a field, you can't just make a mad dash and run from monsters. Each room that contains a magic portal will lock you in until all enemies are defeated. Not only that, but every dungeon layout is completely unique, and the map starts blank, only filling in as you explore, so you never even know what's in the next room. You know, unless you use a fairy's orb and reveal the whole map. But even that won't tell you how many floors there are going to be, so have fun. Making it to the Got statue will reward you with valuable loot, usually including items specifically meant to be sold or traded with other players. Oftentimes for story-related dungeons, you'll find what's called a data bug. This will always be marked with a spooky purple beforehand so you know to get your shit together and make a goddamn save state. Because if you die, there are no checkpoints. You're booted back to the title screen, have fun loading your last save data and starting from your desktop. All the items you found, EXP you gained, progress, time... I cannot advocate for that kind of punishment in a game that can sometimes feel genuinely unfair. So, I hereby allow save states at spooky purples. You're welcome. Fighting a data bug is no easy task, as you'll quickly notice that not only do they have seemingly infinite HP, they also do real big damage. Even if you're the same level of the area you're in, a data bug can still kill you in just a few hits. But you have to power through and keep dealing damage, even if it feels like you're not getting anywhere. Doing enough damage will cause the enemy to enter a protect break state, whatever the fuck that means. But I guess you should just interpret that as data drain time. You can select Data Drain just like any other skill, choose your target, and bam! The monster will return to its normal stats, and you'll be able to defeat it. Using Data Drain on a normal monster will just revert it into a level 1 counterpart, allowing you to kill it easily for those big EXP gains. It will also reward the player with rare items or virus cores, but we'll talk about that dumb shit in a few minutes. Overuse of this ability will cause your infection level to increase, and as it does, Continuing to use Data Drain will also cause negative side effects. Sometimes it can be a status effect, like paralysis, but as the infection increases, the side effects become far more severe, like losing EXP. Maxing it out will actually cause a game over, so it's really important to keep track of. For whatever reason, just killing normal enemies will lower it. I'm not sure that really functions as the most logical thing for the narrative, but it works as a means to balance out this mechanic without putting it on a timer or something the player would have less control over. Now let's hop back over to the story. We receive an anonymous email warning us to stop investigating the game, along with an email from CC Corp, the creators of the game, saying that we won a special level up item from an anniversary event. After a vaguely suspicious description, the shopkeep hands us an item called Book of Law, but when we try using it, it fails to install, citing that it wasn't able to overwrite our character. CC Corp was trying to delete us. Not only that, but it seems like whatever modifications were made to our character are protecting us from CC Corp interference. In the back alleys of Mac Anu, you'll run into a mysterious purple furry and her pet, Elk. She approaches us complimenting our bracelet, seems she can see it. Elk is clearly jealous that Mia is so interested in us. Dude thinks I'm making a move on his online GF. Not interested. Mia later emails us, hinting that our bracelet might have some other function. She gives us some keywords and tells us to come alone if we want to learn more. After defeating a data bug on the lowest floor of the dungeon, Mia agrees to teach us about something called gate hacking. Throughout the game, we'll run into protected areas, keyword combinations that seem to be inaccessible, we learn how to use the virus cores that we obtain from Data Drain to hack into these protected areas using our bracelet. To do this, you'll need certain types of virus cores, which are tied to the size of a monster, while there are also unique cores that you can only get from data bugs. Once you have the required cores, you're able to gate hack into these areas, permanently unlocking them. 
With this ability, you'll be able to investigate infected areas, usually ending with a data bug boss battle. Later, we run into Balmung. It seems he knows Orca, giving us the opportunity to finally explain our story. He hears us out, but quickly leaves, reminding us that the power we're using is the same one that put us in this situation in the first place. Yeah, I know. I don't have to be reminded of it. But before we get too introspective, Helba creeps up behind us, vaguely introducing herself before offering us another warning. This time specifically, Leos, a system administrator that could be a potential threat if he learned of our bracelet. She hands us a rare virus core, says some cryptic shit, and then fucks off. Why do people keep doing this to me? On the board, we find a post about the sighting of a girl in white being chased by a thing with a red wand, along with some keywords for the Theta server. Blackrose emails us, having seen that same post, and then we also receive a spooky, mysterious email of gibberish from an unknown sender. Mmm, blocked and marked as spam. Logging in, we can now select Other Server from the Chaos Gate to access the Theta server. Highland City Dunloriag. I don't know. This town has all the same shops as Mac Anu, but with higher level items and equipment. Same with the Chaos Gate, as it will also send you to higher level areas. But there's something else this server has to offer. The opportunity to raise a grunty. Look at this ugly little guy and just try and tell me you don't want one. In fields throughout the game, you'll find different types of food, and by feeding your grunty, you can raise its stats until it reaches adulthood. Depending on how you raise it, it'll turn into one of three different types of grunty. You'll most likely end up with a noble grunty, but don't be ashamed. There's nothing wrong with having a noble grunty, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Once your grunty is fully grown, you'll be able to call on it from any field on the Theta server, riding it around undetected. Heading over to the keywords we found on the board, we end up running into a literal dead end on the bottom floor of the dungeon. Later we receive an email from Black Rose. It seems someone had modified that post, but she was able to get the original keywords. After gate hacking in, it's clear this area is really infected, with a shattered skybox and lines of code flying through the air. This time when we make it to the bottom of the dungeon, we find a white room, a bed in the center, with teddy bears strewn about. A man's narration comes over, speaking of a girl named Aura, and then a woman's, reciting a rather melancholic poem about a girl longing to return, but ignorant of the sadness that lies at her destination. Exactly what we were looking for, right? Glad we got all these answers. Following another lead, we meet up with the player looking for Orca. Uh, his name is Bob. After telling him what happened, we find out that Orca was actively investigating the same rumors right before we started playing. But that's all the info that Bob has. However, he points us to Linda, giving us some keywords. Meeting up with Linda, where else but the bottom of the dungeon, she fills us in on specifically what Orca was investigating. Apparently he believed that there was something within the world, with an ulterior motive. Well, thanks Linda, that really fucking clears things up, you stupid bitch. We also find out that together with Balmung, Orca is regarded as a legendary player within the world, both carrying the title Descendant of Fianna, whatever the fuck that means. On the board, it explains that they were given this title after clearing a difficult event. But who the hell's Fianna? Why does clearing this event make you her descendant? And how is Orca a legendary player if he's only level 50? After another warning, she reluctantly gives us the keywords for an area that Orca had been investigating. Getting to the bottom of that dungeon treats you with this. There's something about these areas that just tickles my brain in all the right ways. But what does it all mean? What are we supposed to make of this? Looking into a post about a missing player, Black Rose reaches out and arranges a meeting. Of course, at the bottom of another dungeon. Recognizing a pattern? We walk in on Meg speaking with what looks like a shopkeep, but as soon as he notices us, he logs out. Meg says she just posted the keywords the player was last seen at, but that it's pointless to look into it because it's so dangerous. But checking the board again, we find that the post she was referring to was already deleted. Okay, I'm getting real tired of this shit now. Ignoring another spam email, we hear from Helba. She was able to retrieve the deleted post. It sounds like this elf had a run-in with Aura and that creature with the red wand. And now Alf's player is in the same condition as our friend Yasuhiko. Data volume is increasing, and Theta chosen hopeless nothingness. Arriving in town, there's the sense that we're heading into a final battle, being reunited with the thing that put our friend in a coma. We gate hack to access the area, and right away, the bracelet, normally invisible, begins to shine. This is it. We're in the endgame. So let's switch gears and talk about something else. 
we need to take a look at some of the players that have helped us throughout our journey thus far. After all, we couldn't have made it without them. We run into Mistral when looking into a rumor early on in the game, where she witnesses us use Data Drain, thinking it's just some special in-game ability. Intrigued, she offers her member address and burns her dinner. What? Being a Wavemaster, she specializes in magic and healing, often getting spells that recover a lot of HP and can target the entire party. Keeping her on first aid will keep you alive, but having her use skills is just as effective, as she'll likely have a few different elemental spells. Later on in the game, you finally get the chance to have a heart-to-heart -heart with her and tell her your story, but she thinks you're just talking about an in-game event. A strange man blocks her way at the Chaos Gate. Trusting our eyes, he asks for a favor, to meet him in a dungeon and witness him defeat a difficult monster. I mean, sure. But when we make it to the meeting spot, we see him getting his ass kicked. We step in and save him, and after a heartfelt farewell, he offers us his member address and leaves. Having Pyros in your party changes the field and battle theme of all areas to his theme. But it's worth it, I swear. Being a heavy axeman, Pyros has the largest pool of health, along with doing some real big damage. Not only that, but this bizarre and lovable character is actually a parody stand-in for the creator of .hack, Hiroshi Matsuyama. Reading a post on the board about finding specific weapons, we grab some keywords from the thread and head over. In the dungeon, we meet Natsume. She's kinda dumb, but please be nice to her. Given that she's level 1, this area is far too difficult for her, so we head down to the Got statue and grab the weapon she came for. In exchange, she offers... herself? So we add her to our inventory and head out. Natsume kinda sucks. Just a level 1 twin blade. In other words, you take her anywhere and she's just gonna be dead. That being said, because EXP is shared by the whole party, if you do take Natsume to a high level area and keep her alive for the duration of battle, she'll start leveling up crazy fast. Returning to Natsume's thread, it seems someone else is searching for an item. All of these treasure boxes are full of junk! This ain't funny! Holy shit, it's Steve Bloom. It really is the exact same format. You retrieve the weapon for him, and in return we get Steve's member address, and now he belongs to us. Unlike Natsume, this guy's actually competent. He's a heavy blade, same as Black Rose, making him a hard hitter. Then there's Gardenia. She seems to have an obnoxious fan club that's trying to get in contact with her. We meet up with them in a dungeon, where they ask us for assistance delivering a love letter to her. Though when we catch up, Gardenia has little interest. We're forced to chase her to the bottom of the dungeon until she gets cornered by a tough monster, giving us the chance to step in and save her, earning her respect. Or something. She gives us her member address, makes some demands, and then fucks off. Later on, we receive an email from her. Uh, okay. Do you think a Hitori Shizuka would grow here? Yeah, I was just thinking that. So we ride over to the dungeon and make it to the Got statue, where we find an extremely rare item. Did you ask me to come along so I could find this item? You think too much. Let's go back. And, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's it. Thanks. Remember Elk? Me either. So basically we just brutally cuckold him. And repeatedly. The boy doesn't stand a chance. Eventually he gets fed up and jealousy takes over. Elk corners us in town and demands our attention. He threatens us, forcing us to accompany him to his favorite area. But when we arrive, things take an even darker turn. He violently demands we hand over our bracelet, and he won't take no for an answer. Lines are crossed that can't be undone. Things are said that I cannot repeat. And then we run into Mia and he reverts into being her pet again. The two of them are happily reunited and have a long and loving life together. I might joke about Elk, but he's alright. Another wave master, like Mistral. So that's, uh, something nice to say about him. And as for Mia, she's largely absent for most of the game. Most times she won't even answer when you call, despite seeming so interested in us. Her class is a blade master, balanced and basic. Also, if you haven't noticed, she's a purple cat. I don't think we've seen any other players with characters like that. Weird. At one point, Mia shows up in Mac Anu, with none other than our guy Pyros. It seems she's giving him some special item that turns him orange. Apparently he was going for a love potion. Not going to ask. But I am going to switch to talking about Pyros again instead of Mia. Yeah, Pyros gets two sections. Deal with it. Together we head to a dungeon that supposedly has a cure, but the remedy turns him... pink. Then we find custom remedy. That turns him yellow. And finally, we get the first remedy, which turns him orange again. 
eventually you come across the true remedy, which does, in fact, make him normal, or about as normal as Pyrrhos can be. As a reward for helping him out, he gives us his diary. It's an item that, if used, actually lowers your stats. If you don't think this is peak comedy, then I guess I respect your opinion. Throughout the game, you'll be leveling up and customizing all of these party members, preparing them for one thing, to pick the strongest to accompany you into the final dungeon. The final dungeon is difficult. It's tedious. It is long. This, this fucking dungeon is five floors. If you aren't properly leveled, even if you are, it's going to be a struggle to get to the bottom. But when you arrive on that fifth floor, that's where the fear really starts to set in. Simply a straight path from one room to the next, ending with the final spooky purple that seems to lead somewhere beyond the map itself, out of bounds. Passing through, we find Aura, but before we get the chance to talk, a red staff appears behind her, and then... Aura is data-drained, and then looks to be split into fragments and scattered. Oh, fuck. Skate. The Terror of Death. This boss fight is tough. It's best that you actually play the healer while your party gets up close. Use magic from afar, and if you're feeling brave, run up and smack him a few times or use a skill, but for the most part, you don't want to be anywhere near him. You will be dead, and it will be quick. Scathe hits hard, and has special attacks that are undodgeable. Judgment, which freezes all party members and then shatters, dealing significant damage. And once you've been kicking his ass for a while, the screen will fade to black. Scathe will randomly choose one party member to data drain, causing every single negative status effect in the game. And you lose half your health. Not just once, either. At this point, he can just do that between spamming Judgment. But keep pushing, and eventually he'll protect Break, allowing you to data drain him turning him into... glowing rocks? Returning to the battle, Scathe will now have a functional health bar, and it should be smooth sailing. He can no longer use special attacks, he just kind of jumps and makes a big damage shockwave. It won't take long to finish him off from there. The lifeless stones that were once scathe crumble and melt, beginning to bubble as the ground shakes. Blue spikes pierce through the surface, closing in from all directions. Until suddenly... Nothing. A massive creature eclipses the sky above us. and with one roar sends us hurling through the air. Helba appears to once again save us by forcing us to log out. And we're left with these words. We had come so far, but we knew so little. And now, the true battle was about to begin. After the credits roll, you'll have the opportunity to save your completed game data, making it available to transfer into Volume 2. Then it will drop you at your desktop. You'll receive some emails from friends, but most importantly, one from a certain Roy at Bandai. It contains new keywords for a super special secret post-game dungeon. It's actually a unique area. You're atop an airship, one of the many you can see from some fields. Cool, right? Well, it's only the first area. The rest is just a glitchy flesh dungeon. Yeah, that's right, I said that. It's only two floors, and at the end, a unique boss. Parasite Dragon. It may not be a data bug, but it does have a massive pool of HP and, uh, the ability to kill you by breathing in your direction. It also has magic tolerance, meaning Mistral is entirely useless. Don't, don't bring her. Don't bring her. 
Eventually, it will protect break, and upon data drain, you'll get the best twin blade weapon in the game. Perfect thing to hit the ground running in volume two. By hitting certain milestones of data drain usage, you'll receive up to eight of what are called the Books of Ryu. These are items that track all sorts of statistics about the game, like how many areas you've been to, types of enemies encountered, grunty foods collected, all sorts of things. By hitting certain milestones in those books, you'll unlock various wallpapers, music, and movies on your desktop. Also, have we taken a good look at the news yet? Keeping in mind that this is a fictional 2010 through the lens of 2002, it becomes even more interesting in retrospect. Fiber optics at 100 megabits? Revolutionary speech detection that recognizes pauses? Or a VR headset with a 100-hour battery being the selling point? Those were the days. There are also news articles about people mysteriously falling into comas, as well as more general lore info about the universe of .hack. If you're into that kind of stuff. I am. Okay, now let's talk some shit about this game. The first thing I really noticed during this playthrough was the difficulty spikes. Or rather, the constant need for grinding just to keep up with the story mission's area levels. Notably, early on Mia requests that you meet her at the bottom of a level 7 dungeon and to come alone. This near the very beginning of the game, where you're likely like level 3 or 4. And then fight a data bug? Yeah, have fun. So you'll end up doing a lot of grinding just to be prepared. It could be argued that this is essentially just padding the game out to make it longer, but you could also look at it as the developers giving you the reins to experiment with the keyword system, bond with party members, oh, explore, you, and all around encourage independent play. Or maybe it's just padding. In terms of the actual story's length, it does feel pretty short. Time-consuming in terms of working through it, but the actual meat of the story? It's intriguing, yeah, but so much of it is either a dead end or far too ambiguous to make much of. There are interesting plot threads, but they don't get the chance to go anywhere. At least not in this volume. Though I'm sure for many, the biggest issue will be the combat. The constant stop-and-go menu spamming between mashing the attack button just isn't the most fun. There aren't any combos and not much nuance, it's just repeatedly press button. Enemies hit hard and can have really cheap attacks that don't necessarily feel fair. Mimics suck and they always come in groups and cast confusion, making you attack your party members, killing them in just a few hits. Or mad grass, that spam paralysis. Same deal, you're just stuck with no options, waiting to die. You can use antidotes to cure these effects, but you can't always count on party members to have them. Or, most likely, the whole party is paralyzed. Fun. Some enemies can revive themselves repeatedly, or even others, just to waste your time. Part of me wonders if some monsters were made to be intentionally annoying, just to encourage data drain usage so you don't have to deal with their bullshit. In the end, you'll get what you put in. So long as you're well prepared, you should be able to handle anything. Knowing the enemies, elements, what skills your party has available, which enemies to take out first, or if you should use data drain. Making the best use of this knowledge can be really satisfying. But that being said, I'm super biased. Let's take a look at how critics felt back in the day. Dot Hack Infection received generally positive reviews upon release, with most major outlets mainly praising the story. Unfortunately, many of these reviews are lost to time, but I was able to recover some with the Wayback Machine. Probably the most in-depth review was from a site called Game Reviewer, <laughs> and while they rated it very highly, the criticism they did have was that data drain can be frustrating due to the side effects as well as not getting much EXP from monsters if used. However, simply using data drain less often will solve both issues, so that's more of user error, but I will overlook this because he said lots of nice stuff about my game. GameSpy highly praised the gameplay, going on about how satisfying and snappy the combat can be once you're familiar with menu navigation. They even have a sentence simply stating, The game is fun. I don't know if I'd go that far. Just RPG describes the combat as being on the threshold of real-time and turn-based. Something I was actually thinking about during this playthrough, as you have moment-to-moment -moment agency, but there's also the stop-and-go rhythm of using all these menus. IGN got filtered by the camera controls, unable to wield the mighty power of the right analog stick. Not only can the right stick turn the camera, but it can also zoom it in and out, which is very useful for targeting, as you can only target enemies visible on the screen. But it seems many reviewers struggled using it. 
GameSpot's review is more middle of the road, though I do want to point out that this reviewer has poor pattern recognition, and definitely hung out with Pyros a lot. The most negative review I could find was from a website called Thunderbolt. It kicks it off already spiteful of the MMORPG genre, and goes on to criticize how confusing the gimmick of .hack is. The reviewer refuses to engage the game with any level of sincerity, writing off the entire story as, you're just playing a video game, go outside and go for a walk, which I'm sure he thought he was very funny for. He calls the combat a hack and slash, which is entirely inaccurate, and if he was playing it as such, dear god help this stupid motherfucker. The only praise this reviewer had was for the music and voice acting, referencing the soothing melodies and anime all-star casting but then goes on to say that all around the game just falls flat, don't buy it. So that's an opinion. The Dot .hack franchise had a unique concept and execution, but ultimately failed to achieve mainstream success. There are a few reasons why this might have been the case. For one, it's hard to even succinctly explain the concept. So you're playing a game within a game, and the game in the game is an online game, but you're playing a single player game, and the game is called the world. I mean, I understand that taking a second to wrap your mind around. Besides having a complex narrative structure spanning multiple games, anime, and manga series, I can see how it could be confusing or overwhelming just exploring so many forms of media with vaguely connected stories both canon and otherwise. Just search the .hack subreddit for posts asking how to get into the series, it's, it's definitely a barrier to entry. .hack's heavily anime-influenced art style could also have been a factor, with character designs from none other than Yoshiyuki Sadamoto, also known for his character designs in Evangelion. While anime obviously popular in Japan, much less so in the West, especially in the early 2000s. With contemporary titles like Grand Theft Auto, Splinter Cell, and Hitman, it was likely an easy choice for most. .hack wasn't even on their radar. Also, the fact that Dot .hack is only a simulated MMO. Why not just play the real thing? Not only that, but to experience any closure on the story, you'll need to buy four games, each at full price. Imagine if a developer tried pulling something like that today. In the end, the franchise didn't quite achieve the success it had hoped for. But despite this, it gained a dedicated fan base that's still active in many places to this day all with fond memories for this seemingly long-forgotten gem. In a world always looking to new thing, looking back only to turn that into more new thing, I think it's important to appreciate old thing for what it is. Dot .hack might be ancient at this point, but you can still feel the passion in it. A sincere game that immersed you in wonder and mystery, that touched and inspired. I guess I just wanted to say that I'm glad it exists. I'm thankful that it was made, and to the people who made it. I'm not going to argue it's a major part of gaming history, but it's definitely a part of mine. Thank you for taking the time to learn about it. And welcome to...